Alrighty folks, I got hopefully a little treat for you guys today. While I'm trying to figure out exactly what my next big boy video is going to be, I don't want all my loyal viewers out there to starve to death. So I came up with a little idea. In the meantime, I figured I could keep you guys from getting too bored by putting out these quick little biographies on gangsters that you may have heard of and may not have heard of. If you guys want me to go like really obscure, let me know in the comments. I also figured I could use this as an opportunity to see who you guys are more interested in for future video topics. I came up with the name Gangsta Du Jour because it's like a daily special. And for you guys that ain't as cultured as me, it's French for Gangster of the Day. So today's Gangsta Du Jour is none other than Mr. Joseph Murray. Joseph Murray hails from the Green Square Mile, aka Charlestown. While back in the 50s and 1960s, Charlestown was known for vicious gangsters like the Hughes Brothers and McLaughlin Brothers, but by the 80s and 90s, Charlestown was famous for bank robbers and armored car thieves. But Mr. Murray was neither of these. Joseph Murray was reputed to be one of the biggest marijuana dealers Definitely in Boston, but probably on the east coast of the United States. Along with his brother and partner in crime, Michael Francis Murray, they imported and sold hundreds of tons of marijuana annually. They forged contacts with Colombian and then Mexican cartels and were directly dealing wholesale quantities of marijuana. No bullshit, guys. Joe Murray was responsible for probably 90% of that crappy brickweed that everyone used to have to smoke back in the 1980s and 90s. While cutting out the middleman and dealing directly with the source, they were maximizing their profits. Now this type of success doesn't always bring out the best in other people, and Joe Murray's situation wasn't much different. In 1983, when the delusionally paranoid crime lord Whitey Bulger found out that Murray was warehousing literal tons of marijuana in Southie and not paying a tax, Whitey could not abide. So Whitey did the reasonable thing. He got on the phone and called old pal John Conley from the FBI and just told him about Joe Murray's weed stockpile. But Whitey wasn't a rat, of course. Upon seeing six bales of marijuana in Murray's van, they used this as probable cause to search the warehouse without a warrant. Inside the warehouse, they found a whopping 15 tons of marijuana, which is over 30,000 pounds. It was the biggest seizure in Massachusetts history up until that point. Murray thought he just got caught by lucky feds. He didn't suspect his fellow Irish mobster of selling him out for a minute. Then a year and change later in 1984, Murray got involved with Bulger once again, as well as another South Boston gangster, Patrick Mee. They were all throwing in to try to put together the largest shipment of arms to the IRA in history. Patrick Mee, an Irish-born South Boston gangster, switched his focus from the Southie Rackets to trying to aid the Irish Republican Army in their war against the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland. He was robbing banks and armored car trucks specifically to fund the IRA and to buy weapons and explosives to ship to them. Nee was trying to put together a giant shipment, the biggest ever, and to achieve this he was, he was tapping his Boston underworld contacts. Joseph Murray, who was incredibly wealthy from his lucrative drug trafficking operations, had plenty of cash to spare. Murray was also 100% Irish, Charlestown bred, thoroughly pro-IRA, and anti-British. Another Irish mobster Nee contacted was none other than the slippery Whitey Bulger. They probably should have left him out. Hint, hint, wink, wink. I'm going to be doing a full video about this because it's a great piece of Boston lore, plus it took place in my hometown. On board a, sword, a swordfish boat called the Valhalla, the Irish mobsters loaded more than seven tons of weapons and ammunition and explosives onto the boat before it sailed out of Gloucester, Mass. Whether or not Bulger tipped off the feds, or as it's reported, an IRA member defected and tipped off the Irish officials, either way, after making the switch in international waters, an Irish fishing boat was seized by the Irish Navy and all the weapons on board were confiscated. The Valhalla and its crew were also detained upon returning home to America. The boat's engineer, John McIntyre, would end up being brutally murdered by Whitey Bulger in a South Boston basement for talking to authorities about it. How did Bulger know that McIntyre was talking? Because FBI agent John Connolly told him so. John Connolly is a real scumbag. If any man deserves to rot in prison, in my opinion, it's that fucking guy. 
Murray remained around the scene, but out of the headlines until 1994, when in some sort of apparent domestic dispute, he was shot and killed by his wife at their vacation home in Maine. A few years after his death, his name was brought up in connection with the infamous Isabel Gardner art heist. But authorities say that there isn't any factual evidence to back up this claim. It's just another Boston hoodlum who happened to pass away and can't say yes or no if they know anything about the missing artwork. People seem to like to put responsibility for the art's whereabouts on the deceased. Well, hopefully this entertained you guys for a couple minutes. Again, I'll keep putting these out until my next big, big video comes out, and I'll keep you guys updated about that on my community tab. So this concludes today's f and the first episode of Gangster Du Jour, Joseph Murray, the Charlestown Pot Kingpin. Guys, make good choices, take good care of yourselves, and have a great day. I'll talk to you soon.